Hello everybody and welcome to our video on finding limits algebraically. So last time we took a look at the intuitive definition of the limit. We uh, thought about this definition in terms of the graphs of functions and we also looked at how to guess a limit by plugging values uh, into the function and making a table with those values. Uh, but now we're going to look at how we can actually evaluate these things rigorously. So that's really important because as we uh, saw in our last video that you can't really trust those tables to give you accurate values for limits. So we need something more concrete and solid for evaluating these things. So we're going to start with a extremely important definition, but a really simple one. Uh, this definition says if a function is continuous at any x value c, then the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals f of c. So I call this a fact and a definition because this is actually the definition of continuity at a point. This is what we mean when we say something is continuous. We mean that the limit of the function is the same as the value of the function. So let's draw a picture to get a sense of what we mean by that. So first we're going to draw a couple things that are not continuous. So, for example, here, this is not continuous. Intuitively, you would say, hey, uh, there's a break in the graph, there's a jump, right? We think of uh, our earlier, more basic ways of thinking of continuity as there's no jumps, there's no skips, there's no breaks, right? So, we need a stronger tool for evaluating limits than just saying there's no jumps, skips, or breaks. So how do we reformulate this? Well, here, when we have a jump, that tells us that the limit doesn't exist here, right? This is not continuous, and it's not continuous because the limit doesn't even exist. We're approaching different values from the left and right. Uh, I should say limit as x approaches 2 of f of x does not exist. There we go. Right, so if the limit doesn't exist, then it certainly cannot be equal to f of c, right? Doesn't exist in the first place. Okay, where's another, uh, let's look at another example. So let's say, we'll, we'll say this is 3. Now here we've got a hole in the graph, and the value of the function is up here. So let's call this 1 and this 2. And so what do we see? Uh, the limit as x approaches 3 of the function, well, the y value it's approaching from both sides is 1. And the value of the function at 3 is actually 2. And so what can we say? Well, these two things, they're not equal. And so this is not continuous. So when we have a hole in the graph, then we're not going to get continuity because the value of the function is not the same as the value of the limit. So our intuitive definition of continuity was there's no jumps, skips, or holes, but that's actually described perfectly with this rigorous definition that the limit as x approaches c of the function must be equal to the actual value. So let's take a look at that in a graph. So now we'll look at one that is continuous and say at 4. So when we look at this graph, well, what value is being approached from both, both, both sides? Uh, I, I know how to talk. <laughs> uh, as x approaches 4, f of x is approaching 2. Uh, but that's actually the same thing as the value of the function at 4, right? There's no hole in here, so the value of the function is just this place on the graph. So these two things are equal, and so in conclusion we say that this is continuous. So this definition of continuity gives us a great tool because what this says in terms of evaluating limits is, hey, if I already know that this function is continuous, then I can just plug c into the function, and that's the uh, f of c is the value of the limit, right? That's the thing to understand from this. 
If I know that a function is continuous, I can just plug the number into the function and then I get my answer and I don't have to worry about anything else. Okay, so of course not all functions are continuous. So how do we deal with these cases where a function isn't continuous? Like this second graph, for example. This is not continuous, but the limit does exist and the limit is equal to one. So how do we compute the values of limits for discontinuous functions. So let's take a look. That's our second main tool for this topic, and that's the following theorem. If f of x is equal to g of x for all x, except x equal to c, then the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals the limit as x approaches c of g of x. Okay, so what, what does that say? says these two functions are the same everywhere except for at one point, c. And if they're the same everywhere else, then their limits are the same, even though they might differ at the one point. So let's look at another graph. So we'll do uh, one of these in orange, how about? And so this first graph in orange has a discontinuity here. And maybe the value of the function is somewhere up here. And then we'll do another graph in blue. Now, what's the difference between these two functions? They're equal everywhere except at the point C. And in this case, we're using three as our value for C. So the second function that I'm gonna draw in blue, it's gonna be the same exact function, but it's gonna actually be continuous at the point and just pass through that point. So these two functions do exactly the same thing everywhere except at three. And what's happening at three? Well, at three, the same exact y value is being approached. It doesn't matter what happens to this single point on the graph, it matters what's being approached from the left and right. So if two functions are the same everywhere except at that one point, well then they have the same limits at that point. So. That's exactly what we're saying here, right? The limit as, let's call the blue graph F, and we'll call the orange graph G. What we're saying here is that the limit as X approaches three of F of X, it's the same, right? It's two, which is the same as the limit as X approaches three of G of X, even though G of X is discontinuous. So what's the, what's the big point here? Why are these two things so important? Because these are our two main tools for evaluating finite limits algebraically. If we know a function is continuous, we can just plug the number in and then we're done. And if we have two functions where one's continuous and the other isn't, but they're the same otherwise, then they have the same limits. So that means that often finding limits algebraically is gonna come down to just rewriting a function to remove the discontinuity. And we'll see what we mean by that in our later examples. So a couple of facts. First quick fact is that polynomials of degree greater than uh, zero are continuous. So we'll look at some more functions as well, but uh, well, primarily we'll just deal with polynomials, but throughout this class we'll deal with other functions that are also continuous. So we'll deal with exponential functions, logarithmic functions, those are continuous on their domains. Trigonometric functions are continuous on their domains. For this portion of the class so far, we'll just be focusing on polynomials and limits involving polynomials or rational functions. So, fact polynomials of degree greater than or equal to zero are continuous. And so here we've got this limit as x approaches 2 of x cubed minus 2x squared over x minus 2. Now this is not continuous at 2. And it's not continuous at 2 because we can't divide by 0. So this is a rational function, that means it's a polynomial divided by a polynomial. And when we have rational functions, they're continuous everywhere except wherever you get a zero in the denominator. Okay, so what can we do about that? Well, let's take a look. The first thing I'm gonna do is just rewrite my limit a little bit 
by factoring out this common factor of x squared in the top. And then I get x squared times x minus 2 over x minus 2. And the key here is to understand that x minus 2 divided by x minus 2 is always equal to 1, unless x equals 2. So what does that mean? That means that if I was to say x minus 2 over x minus 2 is 1, then this limit becomes the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared. Now here's the key thing. These are not actually the same functions because this function is not defined when x is equal to 2. But they're the same everywhere except x equals 2. Right? Multiplying by 1 doesn't change the value. So that means this function times x minus 2 over x minus 2 is equal to x squared everywhere except for 2. So these two limits are equal because of the theorem that we just went over, right? These two functions are the same everywhere except at the limit point. And so now what? This is a polynomial. So the definition of continuity says, hey, I can just plug this number in. This is a polynomial. Polynomials are continuous. Plug in 2. I get 2 squared. That's 4. So, you know, we had some extra explanation in there to make sure it's clear what's happening, but let's just recap to see how easy this is, right? We say, hey, I've got a polynomial divided by a polynomial. I've got a discontinuity down here. I want to get rid of that discontinuity because if I had a continuous function, I could just plug in. So let's try factoring. We factored. That let us cancel our matching factors in the numerator and denominator. And then that theorem tells us that we'll get the same limit when we look at the simplified function, which is just x squared, and then continuity says, hey, now I can just plug right in, I'm done. And that's it for that example. Okay, so now let's tackle another idea real quick, which is uh, what about limits that don't exist? How can we tell if a limit does not exist? Well, if we have a rational limit, limit is x approaches c of f of x over g of x, and we see that the limit of the numerator f of x equals some number l that isn't zero, but the denominator's limit is zero, then the limit doesn't exist. All right, we can't divide by zero, boom. How does this differ from the previous example? So in the previous example, the numerator and denominator both approach 0 at 2, right? If you plugged in 2 up top, you get 0. If you plug in 2 in the bottom, you get 0. In this case, we're looking at a function who when you plug 2 in the top, you get 9. So let's look at the limit of the numerator. So this is a non-zero number, 9. And the limit of the denominator here, as x approaches 2 of x squared minus 4, well, this is a polynomial, so I can plug in 4 minus 4 is 0. So the limit of my numerator is 9. The limit of my denominator is 0. So we just say the limit of the rational function does not exist. Okay, so quick fact here. So I stated this a little bit before, but we're just restating it here uh, formally. Rational functions, f of x equal to p of x over q of x, where p and q are polynomials, are continuous for all x except where q of x equals 0. Hence, the limit as x approaches c of p of x over q of x equals p of c divided by q of c as long as q of c wasn't 0. Alright, and one more definition. If the limit as x approaches c of f of x is 0, and the limit as x approaches c of g of x is 0, then the limit of their quotient, f of x divided by g of x, is said to be of 0 over 0 indeterminate form. Uh, what does this mean? The limit may or may not 
exist. So let's recap again, and then we'll do some more examples. So if we look at this example one, this was 0 over 0 in determinate form because the limit of the numerator was 0, the limit of the denominator was 0, so that's an indeterminate form. Turned out this limit did exist. We were able to work through this and actually apply continuity and evaluate the limit. Now this was not in indeterminate form. This was a determinate form, but it determined that the limit didn't exist because our numerator was not zero, but our denominator was approaching zero. So what this tells us is that, hey, if I get this situation where the numerator approaches something that isn't zero, but the denominator approaches zero, then I'm done. The limit doesn't exist. But if I get zero for both limits, the limit of the top and the limit of the bottom, then I have to actually try something else. All right? That's all it says. Indeterminate form says you got to try something else. All right? So let's take a look at this example three. So if I go to evaluate this limit, the limit as x approaches 0 of the square root of x squared plus 9 minus 3, so I'm evaluating the numerator by itself, I get square root of 9, which is 3, minus 3, so that's 0. And if I evaluate the denominator, so I look at the limit as x approaches 0 of x, well, that's obviously 0. So we call this 0 over 0 in determinate form. Okay, so what does that mean? That means I don't know. I got to try something else. So what are we going to try? Well, that's the tricky part. So I want to evaluate this limit, but I can't factor in this problem. So again, what are our goals? Our goals are find a continuous function that acts just like this one everywhere except for wherever the discontinuity is, right? This isn't continuous at zero because I can't divide by zero. But I can't factor here because this square root keeps me from factoring things between these two terms, right? I can't just break something. I just can't just break up the square root, right? So how can I deal with this? I want to get rid of square roots. And so we're going to do a little quick review of the idea of a conjugate. So conjugates, you may recall, are the factors of a difference of squares. So whenever you factor the difference of squares, you get a minus b times a plus b. And so these are called conjugates to one another. And we give them a special name because when I multiply them together, I get the difference of squares. I get two squared terms. Why is that so valuable? Because if I have a square root expression, a binomial type expression like this, the square root of something plus or minus something, then multiplying by the conjugate will guarantee that I won't have any square roots anymore because I have to just square both terms and subtract them. So that's what we're going to do here. I'm going to multiply by the conjugate of this expression. So this is a minus b. And so the conjugate a plus b will be the square root of x squared plus 9 plus 3. But if I multiply the top by this, and I don't want my function to change, because then my limit wouldn't be the same, I have to divide also by it, right? So we're sort of doing the opposite of what we did before. Here we factored and canceled a factor to get rid of the discontinuity. Instead, here we're multiplying by a new factor on the top and bottom. It's still equal to 1 if I multiply and divide by the same thing. A number divided by itself is 1. So it doesn't change the function at all. But what it does is allows me to rewrite this limit in a way that I can actually work with. So a minus b times a plus b gives me a squared minus b squared. So that's the square root of x squared plus 9 squared minus 3 squared divided by x times the square root of x squared plus 9 plus 3. 
Now, uh, one thing I just want to point out here, a lot of times what students will do at this point that will cause them problems is they'll try to multiply this x out. But remember, our goal is to get rid of this discontinuity. So if I multiply this out, I'm just going to end up having to refactor it to cancel it anyways. So it's only going to add extra work or cause confusion. All right, so the square root squared means just the square root cancels, and I get x squared plus 9 minus 3 squared, which is 9, over x times, in parentheses, the square root of x squared plus 9 plus 3. Now, the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared plus 9 minus 9. The 9 minus 9 cancels. I get x squared up top, x down here. And now if I have x squared up top divided by x, that leaves me with one factor of x up top. So I get the limit as x approaches 0 of x divided by the square root of x squared plus 9 plus 3. And all right, now why are these two things equal? Well, that's from that theorem we talked about. And now what can I do? Well, I got rid of my discontinuity. The discontinuity was at 0. I canceled the thing that gave me 0 in the denominator at 0. So now I can just use continuity and plug in. I get 0 over the square root of 9 plus 3, but that's just 0. So the key thing to understand here when we're finding these limits algebraically is that the principle we're going to use for all of these problems is the same. The principle is find a continuous function that acts just like the original function. So we had a, a bunch of functions that were all equal, but I still had that discontinuity. And then I canceled the discontinuity. Now I have a continuous function. And so now I can just plug in. How you get to the continuous function is what changes from problem to problem. And that's all about your previous algebra skills. So you have to think about all of the algebraic tools you have available uh, to try to figure out which ones will apply. There are infinitely many different limit problems that all have some variation on them. And so you really have to uh, dig into all of your toolbox from algebra and just apply the appropriate algebra tools with the goals in mind. What are the goals? Figure out how to get rid of the discontinuity, and then you can just plug in. And that's it. Okay, so let's take a look at another problem. So example four, evaluate the limit as x approaches 1 of the cubed root of 6x plus 2. Oh no, what? whatever will I do? Oh wait, cubed root functions are continuous. So all I have is a polynomial inside a cubed root. There's no problem here. This is continuous, so I don't even have to do anything. I can just plug in. Cubed root of 6 times 1 plus 2. That's the cubed root of 8. And so if I ask myself, what number multiplied by itself 3 times gives me 8? Oh, that's 2. All right, so let's move on to another example. So here, I've got another one of these rational functions. So I'm going to go ahead and check the numerator and denominator, because it's always possible that these limits don't exist. And then I could waste a lot of time trying to do algebra that ain't going to work. But I get 0 for my numerator. And when I take the limit of the denominator, what do I get? I get. 49, negative 7 squared is 49, 5 times negative 7 is negative 35, minus 14, oh, that's still 0. So I get 0 for both of these, so that means this is 0 over 0 in determinate form. So I got to try something else, right? So this extra step here, really what it saves you from is the trouble of trying to find a limit that doesn't exist. So it's always good to check that. A lot of the times you can check it in your head. Just make sure you get zero in both the top and bottom. And if you get zero in the top and bottom, then, you know, you got to just try something, you know. So uh, with that being said, what can I try here? Well, I'd always like to get rid of my discontinuity. I've got this factor x plus 7 in the top. 
I sure would like if I could factor this uh, quadratic to cancel that discontinuity. So let's take a look. x squared plus 5x minus 14. All right, so we need, we've got a leading coefficient of 1, so we can just put x and x here, and then I need factors of negative 14 that add up to 5. So uh, 7 and negative 2 would work, so plus 7 and negative 2. So I can factor my denominator here to x plus 7 times x minus 2. And, oh, now I can cancel, and I get 1 over x minus 2. So this is equal to the limit as x approaches negative 7 of 1 over x minus 2. And again, that's that theorem. These two functions, they're the same everywhere, except at the one point, negative 7. But that means they have the same limit. And now I've got a function that's continuous at negative 7, at least. And I can apply continuity and go 1 over negative 7 minus 2. That's negative 1 ninth. Right, this is 1 over negative 9, but that's the same thing as negative 1 ninth. So again, all of these problems, the algebra is different. In the first problem, we just factored a common factor. In the, uh, the problem we did right before this, or two problems before this, we multiplied by a conjugate, and that allowed us to cancel a factor after a little bit of simplification. Right? In this problem, we had to do some quadratic factoring. So, yeah, we have a lot of different situations that come up algebraically, but the approaches from this course's material is the same for each one of these problems, right? You want to apply the theorem. You want to find a function that doesn't have that discontinuity anymore, and then once it's continuous at that point, you can just plug your number right in. Okay, so let's take a look at another example here. Evaluate the limit as x approaches negative 1 of x plus 1 over the square root of x squared plus 1 plus 3x. So, as usual, I'm going to go ahead and just check that I have indeterminate form, just in case this limit doesn't exist, and then, you know, I could save myself some time and just stop right there. If I plug in negative 1, I get 0 for the top. If I plug in, uh, if I evaluate the limit as x approaches negative 1 of the denominator... We get 8 times 1 plus 1 minus 3. The square root of 8 plus 1, that's the square root of 9, that's 3 minus 3 is 0. So this is 0 over 0 in determinate form. Okay, well that's good then. We can at least go ahead and move forward and actually try to solve this thing. Uh, but here we've got another situation where we can't factor because our denominator has the square root. You can think of it like a imprisoning these terms, right? And so if we didn't have the square root, maybe maybe we could get a factor like x plus 1 to show up. So uh, let's give it a shot. How are we going to do this? Well, again, we see a similar situation to before. Where we've got the square root, we'd like to get rid of the square root, and if I multiplied by the conjugate, it'll get rid of the square root. So we'll multiply by the conjugate on the top and bottom. The key here is to remember this is your a plus your b, which makes this your a minus your b. And so when you multiply these things, you get a squared minus b squared, right? And that's because your middle, your inner, and your outer terms cancel, right? You get the same thing but negative, so you only get left with the squared end terms. Okay, so this is the limit as x goes to negative 1 of x plus 1 times the square root of x 8x squared plus 1 minus 3. And again, uh, I don't want to multiply this x plus 1 across because I'm hoping to cancel a factor in the bottom with an x plus 1. So I don't want to multiply this part out. I do want to multiply the bottom out to get rid of the square root. 
So I get the square root of x, 8x squared plus 1 squared minus 3 squared. Okay, so we'll rewrite this numerator a little bit here. We get, it's the same thing. And then the denominator, when I square this first term, I get 8x squared plus 1, because that square just cancels the square root, minus 3 squared, which is 9. Okay, that gives me 8x squared minus 8 in the denominator. Okay, well that's not quite what I'd hoped for. I really want that x plus 1. Well, let's go ahead and see if we can factor this thing a little bit further. So this one's a little bit of a challenging one. But again, we, we just have to keep our goals in mind the whole time, all right? Sometimes we got to do a little extra work to get there, but the goal is really straightforward. I have a discontinuity at negative 1, and I want to get rid of it. Well, somehow I've got to find that discontinuity and squash it. So I factor out this 8, and I get left with 8 squared minus 1. Uh, 8, I get left with x squared minus 1, I meant to say. And that's a difference of squares, so I can go ahead and factor that. So I think we're finally going to get there. Difference of squares factor is going to give me x plus 1 times x minus 1. Ah, and now I can cancel the x plus 1. And we can rewrite this limit. So now I've gotten rid of my discontinuity. And that means I can just plug right in. So when I plug this in, I plug in negative 1. I get 8 times 1 plus 1, that's 9. The square root of 9 is 3. That's 3 minus 3 is 0 over. Uh, 8 times negative 2, that's negative 16. So this whole limit is 0. Whew! That was a tricky one. But again, the same basic principle. Find a function that doesn't have the discontinuity, but otherwise acts the same. And then apply the definition of continuity, which says, hey, I can just plug the number in once I have a continuous function. And then you're done. All right. So let's take a look at this. And uh, yeah, that's going to be our last example. So example seven is uh, state whether the given function f is continuous at c. So the question is pretty straightforward, really, even though it might seem tricky, because what this is asking is, uh, is the limit of the function equal to the value of the function at all of its points? So what do we know? Uh, this function is a rational function, and rational functions are continuous at all x except where the denominators are 0. In this case, x equal to negative 2. So what's the, the trick here? The trick here is that this is actually a piecewise function. So this function is continuous everywhere except at negative 2, but the function we're dealing with is defined as negative 4 at negative 2. So what we have to see is 
is the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x equal to f of negative 2. That's the real question, because that's what continuity means. So we already know that f of negative 2 is negative 4. Okay, well, what's the limit as x approaches negative 2? Well, remember, the definition of the limit says, hey, I don't care what's happening at negative 2, I just care what's happening everywhere else. And when I look at this piecewise function, everywhere else is the top part, right? If x is not equal to negative 2, you just do this. So that means if I want to evaluate the limit, I just look at that part. x squared minus 4 over x plus 2. And let's see if we can evaluate this limit. Oh, well, the top factors to x minus 2 times x plus 2. And now my theorem says, hey, I can cancel that, and I'll get the same limit. And so now I've canceled my discontinuity. And so the definition of continuity says, hey, you can just plug right in now. And negative 2 minus 2 is negative 4. So, yes f of negative 2 equals the limit as x approaches negative 2. So f is continuous. Now keep in mind, we really want to make sure that f is continuous for all values of x, but we already know that this function is continuous for all of the other values of x, so we only have to check explicitly the problem function, or the problem point, I should say, at x equals negative 2. All right. Well, that's it for this one. Thank you for watching.